Good afternoon and greetings from Western Kentucky University. Welcome to the Midwestern Association of Graduate Schools, MAG's Fall 2021 Signature Event. This event is being recorded and will be posted online. If you have any concerns, you may exit and not participate. My name is Ranjit Kudali, and I'm privileged to serve as chair of MAGS and as associate provost for research and graduate education. Today's event has two parts. I now kindly ask Dean Julie Masterson from Missouri State University to facilitate the first part of the event related to effective graduate mentoring. Dean Masterson. Well, hello everybody and welcome to the MAGS 2021 Fall Signature Event. We are so excited to be able to present for you today effective graduate mentoring evidence-based practices from uh, IUPUI. Our speakers today, both from IUPUI are Randall Roper, who is the director of the Graduate Mentoring Center and Associate Professor of Genetics, and Janice Bloom, who is the Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Education and Associate Dean of the University Graduate School. Uh, they have a really uh, very exciting presentation for you. My job is to basically be the time bouncer. So we have until approximately 2.20-ish uh, for the first part of the presentation from Randall and Janice, and then we're going to do breakouts. That'll take about 20 minutes, then we'll come back and do brief reports and handle Q&A to the extent that time allows us. So um, I would encourage you, if you have questions or comments, to put them in chat, and Randall and Janice will be monitoring, as will I, and then I will come back on. I'll turn my camera back on, Randall and Janice, with about a minute or two uh, left before we do breakout groups. And then uh, Ranji can instruct us on how to uh, decide on breakout groups. We'll build in some time for that too, about how to choose. So without further ado, um, Drs. Roper and uh, Bloom from uh, Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis. Thank, thank you so much, Julie. And, and thanks to our colleagues and Max for inviting us to speak today and um, Randall and I are delighted to tell you about effective graduate mentoring, uh, the evidence-based practices we're using at IEPY. If we could have the next slide, Randall. So in developing our graduate mentoring center at IEPY, we took a look first at our campus. And while we offer a broad spectrum of degrees and programs, uh, the majority of our, our graduate students in both doctoral and master's programs are enrolled in STEM, health and life sciences programs. And so we kept that in mind uh, in developing our center. We also have a growing enrollment and that's been consistent for probably the last five or six years in students from underrepresented first generation to college and marginalized groups. So we wanted to be uh, aware of that in the programming. And that was also a, a key motivator, I have to say, for the mentoring center, the need to serve those students. We additionally have multiple federally funded grants and many of those from NIH and NSF have requirements for graduate student mentoring. And that has become an increasingly important focus uh, in, in federal funding agencies. And finally, our campus has a longstanding and ever-growing focus on diversity and inclusion. Uh, we're proud to note that we're one of the first in the nation to uh, include in our promotion and tenure uh, policies, a category where faculty can uh, include their work on in diversity and inclusion um, as, as part of their uh, tenure and promotion packet. So these are, these are important. Thank you, Randall. Um, the goals of the Mentoring Center at IUPUI, and hopefully if you have a center or are thinking about a center, these are important to identify. We wanted to provide resources and opportunities for both faculty and staff to strengthen <coughs> their skills. We wanted to inform our faculty and staff about best practices in mentoring. We wanted to teach our graduate and professional students about mentoring. We wanted to foster our graduate and professional school, um, professional student academic and career success. And we wanted to promote a greater understanding of diversity across our campus. And so these were central themes. In the next slide, please. We also strategized a lot about how to develop the center. Um, we wanted to recognize and uh, 
probably many of you have encountered instances where it's important to convey to our colleagues that proper mentoring is really essential. We knew that students wanted to recognize outstanding mentors, as did we, to kind of highlight these people and raise them up uh, as champions and, and individuals that could help mentor their colleagues. Uh, we also wanted to provide a venue to share best practicing for men mentoring, we wanted to instruct in mentoring competencies, and a key back to, again to our um, focus on diversity inclusion, we wanted to address culturally aware mentoring in our mentoring center. Next slide. Randall? So we started, we started our center in uh, the, at the beginning of 2018. And one of the first things that we did was we instituted an award for the IUPUI Outstanding Graduate Professional Student Mentor Award. And we've given this award so far four, four times. Um, we invite nominations from faculty, staff, and students from across campus. On um, the first year we did this, we had 70 nominations. Um, this past year, Dr. Matt Allen uh, received our, our award for Outstanding Graduate and Professional Student Mentoring. And you can just see by what this says about Dr. Allen, about what, what uh, these mentees are staying, saying about these outstanding mentors. Dr. Matt Allen, persistently advocates and supports his mentees with their professional development and well-being at the core of his holistic mentoring approach. And we have seen this time and time again with our outstanding mentors. We've had mentors from the law school. We've had mentors from basic sciences. And, and just our students rave about the fantastic mentors that we've been able to identify. And we've used this as a a launching off point to help spread these best practices throughout campus. So we used, um, to start talking about mentoring, we utilize the NRMN, so the National Research Mentoring Network, or it's also known as a CIMR, or Center for Improvement, Improvement and Mentored Experiences and Research. And you can see the, the URLs at the bottom. So we, we went and we utilized their framework. And so I was fortunate enough to be, to be uh, trained in their entering mentoring program and became a facilitator to teach this entering mentoring program or this level one training. And so we began by hosting a number of lunch and learn sessions, both for our graduate and professional students, as well as our faculty, concentrating on the core principles that were being taught by, uh, through this program from the NRMN or SIMR. And those principles are, and these are principles of mentoring, maintaining effective communication, aligning expectations, assessing understanding, addressing equity and inclusion, fostering independence, and promoting professional development. So we have just, we have provided a number of one-off sessions on these subjects. And then we, um, at least two or three times a year, I facilitate this, and this has been co-facilitated by Ed Award, who is on our research staff and the office, office of Vice Chancellor for Research. Um, and we facilitate this uh, mentoring uh, training for faculty and staff. And then during the summer, we also facilitate it for our graduate and professional students. And so here you can see, this is one of our groups. This is pre-pandemic, one of our groups where we um, facilitated this, this, these mentoring dialogues that we call them. And we emphasize that this was a national program. These are nationally known entities. They're recognized by the NSF, by the NIH. And when the, the, the mentors complete this program, they get a certificate of completion and we show them how they can put a line on their CV to show that they participated in this program <laughs> and it really means something. Um, another thing that we've done as I mentioned, as we've also done this for our graduate and professional students, and we do this every summer, we sit down with them, and we're really teaching them how to be better mentors, as well as how to mentor up. What should they be expecting from their mentors? And we've seen a lot of success, especially as we've seen the faculty and their trainees take the same um, take the same mentoring course. And so they're speaking the same language and have the same types of expectations. Another thing that we've done is we've, we hold a monthly meeting for our graduate and professional students. And we call these our midday mentoring dialogues. 
We collaborate with a number of student organizations, our underrepresented um, professional and graduate student organization, our Preparing Future Faculty and Professionals program. We um, collaborate with them and we just talk about different topics that are important or that we think would be important. And we ask our graduate students and professional students which topics they would like mm -hmm. to talk about. So for instance, uh, earlier this month, we had a session on how to choose a mentor. Um, this later this week, we have a session on graduate student life hacks where we have um, a number of seasoned graduate students that are giving their best advice on how to survive and thrive in, in graduate school. We've had um, programs on negotiation, networking, interviewing, a number of these topics that our graduate and professional students have found very useful. And in 2020, we actually won an award for the Outstanding Collaborative Program of the Year at IUPUI. And so we can see that this is making a difference in the lives of our um, of our graduate and professional students. We also have um, in our annual programming, a, uh, a program called Trailblazers and Innovators, where we invite someone from throughout the world who has been exceptional in mentoring, especially in, in mentoring underrepresented groups. Um, this past year, of course, it was all online. And we had Dr. Ainsley Abraham, who is the director the director of the Southern Region Educational Board State Doctorals mm -hmm. Program. This is a program that helps our underrepresented PhD students to complete their PhD and enter into the professorial. <coughs> and she had some fantastic recommendations for us um, on some ways to improve our mentoring, especially of underrepresented students, as well as how to recruit underrepresented faculty to our campus. And so this is a yearly program that we do and, and it's just fantastic. As Janice mentioned, we have concentrated on culturally aware mentor training. We have brought the NRMN's program for culturally aware mentor training to our campus and had the support of most of the um, schools on campus had their financial support because they thought this was important. Mm -hmm. We followed up with seminars from individuals on our own campus. Um, a conversation about bias in mentorship, community mapping as a tool for developing culturally relevant pedagogy, and um, cultural humility. And so we followed up on this, and we are hoping to continue to develop these kinds of courses. And so these are, these are some things that we're doing at our mentoring center to try to engage both our faculty, well, our faculty, our staff, and our students in, in better mentoring practices. Janice? Yes, thanks, Randall. So we're, we're often asked, uh, what is the, the secret sauce or the magic um, in our mentoring center? And I think one of the things we really emphasize uh, to others is collaboration and collaboration is really key. And that includes um, working with partners in our office as well as partners outside our institution. Uh, I've committed and in, in working with Randall that all of the graduate office staff will help uh, the mentoring center and provide uh, key administrative support. So we help maintain the website, we help with purchasing, um, travel reser reservations, and we provide desk space for a graduate student assistant that works with the mentoring center within our, our graduate office. We also have collaborations, strong collaborations with several student groups. Uh, Up and Go is our uh, diverse, um, underrepresented professional and graduate student organization, uh, preparing future faculty and professionals program on our campus, our student government, the uh, Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion uh, on our campus, as well as at our university. Our writing center collaborates with us, and there's also a national mentoring symposia that we participate in. And we've also uh, had invitations to speak at a number of meetings. So most of you know, <laughs> despite hoping that uh, if, you, if you are there, they will come in graduate and professional programs, our students are busy. And so we provide a number of ways where we advertise or try to communicate what's going on and how um, students can avail of themselves of the various activities as well as faculty and staff. So we have a website that's maintained in our office. We have a dedicated email. We have a monthly newsletter. Uh, we use Instagram. That's part of the work of our graduate student assistant uh, that's in the center. 
Uh, we have a graduate affairs committee where uh, we communicate monthly all of the activities at the center as well as other um, news that's uh, to our associate deans for graduate programs. We communicate through the student organizations and we also do presentations to departments. We'll offer to go and, and do a special tailored presentation on mentoring as well as outreach to staff. And I, I wanna emphasize that last point because many of you know, as I do, that staff are our unseen mentors and they're often a comfort or the person who will connect with a graduate or professional student um, when they're struggling or just on that day to day, say, how are you, uh, you know, help perk the student all, all up a little bit to get them through the challenges. So we definitely include staff. Um, there's a quick question, Randall, I'll address. It says, please share staffing in the center. We have a director, which is Randall. We have the graduate student assistant, and they are the only <laughs> two dedicated people in the center. But my assistant dean, Dr. Tabitha Hardy, puts a significant amount of work into helping Randall. As Randall mentioned, a lot of the presentations are co-facilitated by our assistant vice chancellor at award and those discussions with students. And our funding, uh, the majority of the funding for the center comes from our, our IU president, Indiana University president. It was part of a diversity initiative and they uh, initially wanted one graduate mentoring center for all IU campuses and then realized that was not sufficient. And so we now have a graduate mentoring center in Bloomington and at IUPUI in Indianapolis. And um, probably the funding I'm guesstimating is um, maybe $70,000, $80,000 a year uh, to support the center. Uh, a lot of that goes towards programming and food and events. We're not having as much food and events, so we don't quite have to do uh, spend all those costs. But still, uh, as Randall mentioned, we have invited speakers and certainly awards that we provide. So um, next slide, please, Randall. So I, um, if you'd address this too, Janice, because I think that there's a question that says, how did you get support to create the mentoring center? I think that's an important question to answer. Sure. Uh, this initially, as I said, um, was part of a, a plan under our diversity efforts um, from the president. But it, you know, having that big idea alone is never enough. And so we really had to reach out with deans and talk a lot to deans about the need and communicate the need. Uh, we definitely worked with uh, graduate program advisors. Um, you know, this is supported from the campus administration on down, the chancellor, um, you know, the, all, all of the, uh, the diversity office. You know, we had to bring a lot of people on board and emphasize that graduate students are as important as undergraduate students. And, and what we've seen miraculously, and I think we're very proud of this, Randall in particular, is that the mentoring we do uh, translates across many um, different groups. So faculty will take some lessons they learn from mentoring graduate students and apply that to undergraduates, as well as mentoring their colleagues, other, other uh, faculty. I think Bill's asking me about faculty participation. We're gonna, we'll get to that, Bill. We'll show you some numbers. Um, if I had to estimate, Randall, I'd say maybe we're at 20%. I don't know, faculty participating, yeah. So let's yeah. move on to the next slide real quickly. So, so you wonder, you know, are, are people really benefiting from this? And these are just, these are um, evaluations. So we do an evaluation after all of our programs and you, you can begin to see what people are saying about this type of, of, of programming. I really enjoyed this training, got more out of it than I was expecting. Um, the last one, initially I was feeling stagnant in my career and I questioned my ability to be a strong mentor. After my participation in the workshop, I walked away confident and ready to take on more opportunities. I'm excited to share my knowledge and I'm committed and open to further, further developing my knowledge and skills. So those are from faculty. Um, this is from student training, you know, novel insights, practical applications, good takeaways, um, relevant topic, very helpful information, concrete examples of what it looks like in the real world. And so I think we're really reaching our, our faculty and staff. And, and like Janice mentioned, 
uh, the number of faculty and staff that have been engaged is, has been really good. So we started the center in, in 2018. Uh, 540 staff, faculty, and students were engaged in our mentoring programs. And we basically had this number, um, 2019, you can see almost 900. 2020, we dropped a little bit. The pandemic dropped us a little bit. And then 2021, we're, on, we're still on a good course. So we're still engaging a lot of faculty and graduate and professional students, as well as staff in our, in our mentoring programs. Just like all of you, um, you know, we had to shift online during the pandemic. And so we shifted all of our programming online. We conducted all of our training. We had our midday mentoring dialogues, our trailblazers and innovators online. And we learned that mentoring and teaching about mentoring is difficult online. And, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. Janice? Yeah, just real quickly, these are some of the current plans and future plans. I, I know we're right at the point to switch. We we're, we're, we're developed some tools to look at trauma and also um, we're very interested in working with colleagues who are um, looking at uh, approaches to uh, address sexual harassment. And we continue to get inquiries from colleagues asking us to participate in writing grant applications and they want information on the center for grant applications. So it's, it's been really productive overall. I think that's an approach you might use with your leadership that this helps students, but it also connects back to research and training grants. So these are some of the questions we hope that will um, be discussed. And these are our observations. Um, certainly um, more and more people are, are getting to know about our, our mentoring center. Um, we have continually good attendance at our events. Um, we now see we're trending more towards smaller niche groups. Initially, it was broad faculty distribution. Now we'll have a department uh, specifically reach out. Um, and then again, collaborations with those writing grants. And then overall, we're really establishing, I think, a culture of mentoring excellence. And it's translating to faculty, students, staff. It's, it's a much more inclusive um, environment on our campus. And I think the mentoring centers contributed to that. Next slide. So these are four of the, the topics that we uh, would like you to think about and that will be discussed in the next session in breakout groups. So um, how do I learn more about how to be an inclusive mentor? How do I best mentor graduate students when they're online? Uh, I'm mentoring graduate and undergraduate students. Are they, is that the same? And how do I get mentors that need mentor training to participate in programs? Well, thank you so much. This was great. We are going to move into breakouts and we will take about 15 minutes or so for breakouts. Um, and Ranjit, if you can come on and give people instructions for, do they get to choose the breakout group or have we randomly assigned them to breakout oh, sure. groups? Oh, thank you, Julie. As Janice mentioned, we have four breakouts uh, rooms. The first is approaches to inclusive mentoring, and we will have a reporter uh, who will uh, report back and facilitate discussions. The second one is breakout session is mentoring online for graduate students. Uh, Carrie and Hazlett will uh, facilitate that. The third breakout session is mentoring graduate and undergraduate students. What are the differences? What are the similarities? And uh, Dr. Algerian Hart will uh, facilitate that. The fourth, uh, Breakout session is addressing gaps in mentoring and Dr. Kerry Wilkes will uh, facilitate this. I will open all the rooms and you may, you are able, I think you should be able to join any of those se breakout sessions. Well, it looks like everybody is back, has come back. Some of you may or may not have been in the middle of the sentence and I pulled you out of that group and threw you into another group. So that could have been fun, uh, trying to keep things balanced, but um, so welcome back. Uh, we're gonna take um, just a few minutes um, to um, have folks report out. And then if we have some time for Q&A at the end, we will do that. We have a pretty hard three o'clock stop time because we're moving to the next part to get to hear about our thesis winners. So I'm gonna do something crazy and just go in reverse order. So reporters, about a minute or so, um, hit the high points. Carrie, can you tell us about addressing gaps in mentoring? 
Sure, uh, addressing gaps in mentoring, otherwise known as help. My faculty member is a jerk, what do we do about it? <laughs> Uh, which of course everyone smiled about, which in and of itself is a depressing. But um, we wondered if uh, we needed to do this before it was needing needed. So maybe it should be mandatory to work with graduate faculty, I mean, graduate students. Um, we had a really interesting point at the beginning about the use of staff. Um, we don't have that at WSU. But are we utilizing our staff appropriately or, or do we only talk about faculty and how do we uh, welcome staff at the table and, and how do we give them the training that, that they uh, might want to be more effective at advising or mentoring. Um, and then one of the talking points that I thought was really fascinating came from an example that Randall supplied, which was, you know, the whole, how do we incentivize this, right? Um, faculty are stretched too thin and, you know, it, it's grants and publications that always count at the end of the day, as we know. Uh, and, and Randall used his own personal experience of his grant activity has quadrupled since implementing this. And so like, I can't really think of a better incentivization, incentive <laughs> than, than a quadruple rate of uh, increase. I think that's about it from our group. Great. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, again, I'm just randomly doing this. Carrie Ann, what about mentoring online for grad students? Yeah. So um, we had uh, some folks who are uh, new to mentoring, and uh, we also had uh, Kirsten Tolson, who at MSU has uh, a little bit more uh, effort that's been uh, initialized there around um, around mentoring and some of the things that they've done online, uh, including um, uh, doing uh, uh, some MOOCs, some videos, uh, and, and being able to uh, do more than just hand people text and say, hey, read through this case or, or this role play um, that have been very helpful. Um, they also have um, mentoring liaisons in each college that help facilitate um, communication between their central uh, mentoring efforts and the colleges. Um, but one of the, the questions that came up or one of the issues came up is it's not just about mentoring online um, because it could be mentoring online for on-campus students, could also be mentoring online for online students and that those may be um, different efforts uh, with different needs. Um, uh, we were fortunate to have Janice in the group with us, and she described uh, their efforts to uh, mentor different types of students, some work with affiliation groups, um, that they're still using Zoom, <laughs> and that there is benefit to, to that, um, but also keeping in mind that, you know, some of those on-campus draws are, are helpful as well. Um, I think we, we po po point back to food as being the draw for graduate students, but convenience of being able to connect online is also a draw. So. Thanks, Carrie ann um, Algerian, your group? Yes, um, I wanna first off thank the group for uh, being open and, and, and transparent uh, with their thoughts. One of the things is it's first discussion because obviously it was undergraduate and graduate, um, the traditionalism and how we tend to mimic um, what a previous mentor had done. And we view that as what true mentorship is about. And in fact, that doesn't allow for the growth and truly to engage with today's student and their needs. And so some of that, that conversation evolved into uh, coming up with uh, pathways for training and what that training is like, because mentorship is not always something that is a you know, a learned behavior. There, there needs to be some level of engagement and a better understanding to assist faculty for those that do have that capability and desire to mentor and um, employing training for that. Uh, one thing that was brought up by one of the individuals was from the undergraduate perspective, going from high school all the way through your undergraduate experience, you're pretty much told um, what, you know, the, those next steps are. And as you evolve, into that graduate student, you get to a point to where you have a choice 
Um, at least it, it, on paper, you have a choice, right? And so some of that is about what mentorship does to cultivate that choice. And then moving into, and I will say Benny, because he's, he's, he's in the throngs of the, the doctoral process, and he discussed that mentorship from undergraduate, even all the way through um, his graduate experience has been seminal and instrumental to his success. And I, I go to that next part here where um, that isolation coming out of a pandemic and faculty and, and others checking in on students and, and their well-being and their, their mental health and displaying a level of empathy, but not forgetting in this mentorship paradigm that oftentimes we forget that we need some assistance. So some have felt isolated and alienated and try to figure out how do I do that and maintain being an effective mentor. And that's about it. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to um, ask Ranjit to uh, cover what his breakout group did in just a moment, but I want to personally thank Randall and Janice for a wonderful presentation, thought-provoking conversation. And I feel like, you know, I'm the coach that's going, get out of the blocks, hurry, 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 because we had to have a lot of content crammed into a very short amount of time. But Jerry's put this in the chat that this will be available on uh, our YouTube channel. And so you, you can access it, access it, mull about a little bit more, but Ranjit, you're gonna do double duty. Tell us about your breakout group and then lead us to the next section of our time today. Oh, wonderful. Uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, we had a relatively small group and what struck uh, some of us, the first thing was the intentionality and the focus on diversity and inclusion when the Graduate Mentoring Center vision uh, was created. So being very inclusive and mindful of the diversity uh, of graduate students uh, and focusing on diversity and inclusion while planning for the development of the center we felt was something that was striking and really, um, really remarkable. Uh, comments were also made about many of the activities such as the monthly meeting, the midday mentoring dialogues, the trailblazers and innovators. Uh, the culturally aware mentor training program was also seen as something really very powerful and helpful. And the inclusion of alum as well, and all these elements and uh, workshops and meetings and bringing together uh, faculty and staff and students uh, to help them uh, in the success of students was seen as something as positive attributes. One of the things I struggle, and Julie, you had mentioned, is how do we mentor faculty? You know, we are trained in the discipline, right, as a chemist, as a speech language pathologist, et cetera. We do not receive formal training in mentoring. And so the use of um, uh, national bodies like CIMER, et cetera, and using those resources and going, uh, reaching out to them and being formally trained and bringing those ideas and evidence-based practice, practices to our respective campuses is, is a way for each of us to be educated, to, be, to keep up with the times and to inform and engage uh, with our students. So that'll be my short uh, spiel, uh, Julie. Uh, perhaps uh, Janice and Randall, we have plenty of time. Perhaps they could uh, share, uh, take a couple of minutes each and share uh, last, few minutes thoughts maybe. I, I guess I, I will go and I will just say, um, you know, the mentoring center has, has really been fantastic um, and it's been a great experience for me. Um, I, I run a research lab, I teach classes and, and I have the mentoring center. You know, when I, when I walk in to talk about mentoring and I tell them I have six graduate students and 12 undergraduate students that I mentor in my lab, I think I get people's ears. And, and so it's a real thing for me. And I, you know, I tell people that I, I tried things out on my students and, and if something works, I'm gonna share it with people. So um, it's, uh, it's just been very fulfilling to me. I really like um, serving in this role. I really like working with Janice and the graduate, student, the graduate um, school because they've just been so, wanting this to go forward. And I think that's really been a success at our university is, is the graduate office just saying, we want this, we need this and their support. And so I can't give enough kudos to, to Janice and her group about, about seeing this vision and, and providing the structure for it. Janice? 
Thanks, Randall. And again, um, we had the largest number of students graduate uh, this summer uh, ever from our campus. So in, in the graduate professional degree program. So I'm hoping that's partly a testament to helping our students through the mentoring center get through um, this last year, uh, year and a half with COVID. Um, but additionally, I, I wanna encourage our colleagues not to be very intimidated by the cost. You really can start out um, if you can get a few interested faculty members, um, you know, the funding a student to help them, it's, it's really not that high of a cost. And oftentimes your colleagues really do want this. And we've been amazed, we've been amazed at the turnout of faculty members from all across the campus, the professional programs, uh, you know, every, every school, almost every department has had at least one, if not more faculty members. Um, and even the staff, the staff are thrilled to be a part of this. Uh, they're always interested in helping students. And so having that formal training uh, boosts their integration and their their sense of being a part of uh, supporting our students. So it's it's been very beneficial for, for us. And I think, uh, I hope you'll all try to uh, investigate looking at developing a center or at least bringing a center, some center programming um, from national organizations. Uh, reach out to Randall and I. Um, we have lots of other colleagues that have great mentoring programs around the country as well. So thanks for allowing us to present today. Julie, we are doing good with time. We have five minutes before the top of the hour, so perhaps we could take a question or two. Do we have questions from the audience to uh, Janice or Randall? Julie, any final thoughts as a facilitator, moderator, before we start our next event? Well, again, this was so helpful for me because I appreciate the multifaceted approach that you have taken to mentoring. I was struck by the comment that sometimes uh, you learn about how to be an effective mentor uh, because of uh, seeing a colleague do something or maybe something that was done with you that you don't want to do or you may want to do. And that multi-levels, I think, is important. I, I really, I told my breakout group that um, some of these things really continue to be uh, very challenging for me and difficult for me, and I have, a, I, have, I have some learning to do. So I appreciate this resource, and it's very comforting uh, for me to know that there are uh, these professional associations, these professional resources that I can tap into. So again, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for your willingness to do this quickly. Again, we're going to post this information for you so you'll have a little bit more time to mull about it. Uh, Janice, uh, Randall, this was really, really helpful. And I personally would just like to come to Indianapolis and sit at your feet for a little while and learn a little bit more um, about all of these areas. But it was a great start today. So now I think we're about ready to switch over and hear uh, about our thesis winner. So I'm excited about that too. Thanks again. Wonderful. So please join me in giving a round of applause to Dr. Randall Roper and Dr. Janice Bloom. I'm also grateful to Dr. Julie Masterson uh, Dr. Kerry Ann Haslett, uh, Dr. Algerian Hort, and uh, Dr. Kerry Wilkes for facilitating uh, the breakout sessions. We now move uh, to the second part of today's event, honoring two exceptionally and talented graduate students. And joining with me is Dr. Peter DeHort, Associate Vice Chancellor for Graduate Studies at University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, to facilitate this uh, session. Dr. DeHort, uh, the Zoom. Session is yours. Thank you, Dr. Crudelli. I appreciate it. And thank you all for being here today. Um, I wish we had a, a, an opportunity in person. We will in the future um, to celebrate the, the great achievements of our graduate students um, and the work that they did. So uh, the first thing that I wanted to say is um, also uh, uh, thank you to uh, Denise Collins, who is a co-chair of the Distinguished uh, uh, Thesis Award Committee. Uh, who's unable to, to be here today, but uh, she sends her, her best wishes to uh, the winners um, and, and her support for this event as well. Um, also, uh, thanks to ProQuest, uh, and ProQuest is the, the sponsor for the Distinguished Thesis Award today. Um, uh, just a, a, a quick insider note about this, uh, as we were wrangling and trying to figure out um, reviews of, of different theses for these uh, two categories, 
in this past year, the social behavioral sciences category, as well as mathematics, physical sciences, and engineering. Um, having personally uh, read through every single title, every single abstract, and looking at all the materials of these, wow, what an amazing uh, group of submissions from uh, across the Midwest, uh, across many different types of institutions, uh, large and small, uh, in, in, in many different structures of, of their departments and, and categories, and just the amazing uh, research that has taken place and the write-up of that research itself in the, in the actual thesis. Uh, so this award is, um, it's something actually, it, it, it is, I would say uh, to, to the, the winners that are here today, um, please know that uh, you are among uh, probably the best of the best. They were all kind of filtered and chosen from the various universities. And this was really some, some amazing work. Um, a few of the things that stood out to me were uh, particularly with the winners today, the clarity of thought um, and the transmission of that thought in the writing of the thesis. Um, and I think that's very, very important when we're trying to translate the important research developments that we do to broader audiences, uh, right? Helping us make a more informed public. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll announce the award winners and then allow them to uh, just tell us a little bit about their, their work. Um, uh, very briefly, and as well as their experiences as a graduate student, uh, if they don't mind. So the first category is for that of the social and behavioral sciences category. Um, and this individual comes from the great state of uh, Wisconsin, at least for the graduate work. Uh, I, I'm a little bit biased here myself, I know. Um, and uh, uh, Benny Witkowski, who uh, focused on sociology, um, wrote a thesis uh, titled The Local Periphery, Small Cities and the Politics of Exclusion. Uh, so Benny, congratulations. And if you don't mind just saying a few words, a little bit about the work and a little bit about your experience as a graduate student, I think that'd be great. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for introducing me and thank you so much for the award. Um, my master's thesis, which I'm currently kind of expanding and deepening into my PhD dissertation, uh, looks at local politics and local political inequality, particularly in small cities in Wisconsin. I am also from Wisconsin, so I appreciate the Wisconsin focus here. Um, and I, so I look at sort of participation in local government, who votes, who goes to meetings, how people feel their voices are being heard or not being heard in local politics. And then the ways that um, state and national politicians are able to sort of take advantage of longstanding patterns of inequality and exclusion in local government. Um, so that's the research I'm working now on expanding it and particularly focusing on the way that uh, partisan politics either does or doesn't interact with nonpartisan local politics and sort of that, that gap there. Um, graduate school has been great. I don't know what else to say about I, this research is it's ethnographic research and historical research. So it takes a really long time. Um, and so having the support of an advisor and a mentor and a department through that process, being able to teach through that process um, and be financially supported has been super important to me. Um, and yeah, I don't know what, you, what else you're looking for, but thank you very much. Thank you, Benny. I can tell you, I, uh, I personally appreciated reading your work, um, given the unique political nature in the state of Wisconsin and how important it is to look at politics at a local level. Um, and we experience it from the University of Wisconsin system all the way down to um, local uh, government functioning. So uh, we're, we're going through a very unique atmosphere in Wisconsin, is unlike many other states in the country in terms of the, the I said unique many times, but the unique political nature of, uh, of the state. So thank you for your, for your work and for being here today. Um, and uh, the next category, so for mathematics, physical sciences and engineering category, uh, our winner is Richard Gross. And Richard Gross uh, hails from Grand Valley State University. And his thesis is on uh, the algorithm for geodetic positioning based on angle of arrival of automatic dependent surveillance broadcasts. Now, I have to also fully admit that I needed to lean on experts for this one because this is nowhere near my, uh, my field of expertise. Uh, but I wanna uh, congratulate Richard and invite him to say a few words about uh, his experience as a graduate student as well as his project. 
Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is an honor to be here, and uh, Benny's given me a, a tough act to follow here, so I'll, I'll see if I can, uh, can hold up to his standard. Um, my thesis uh, is based on uh, the proliferation of ADSB capable aircraft and ADSB is a new technology that has has recently uh, been mandated by the government where commercial airliners are required to transmit their present position, their velocity, their heading uh, about once a second so that other aircraft in the area and uh, air traffic controllers can have more precise positioning information on the air traffic. Well, I had an idea that all of these uh, transmissions that are becoming regulatory standard now could, could possibly be used in some way as signals of opportunity to help an aircraft that maybe has a GPS failure or is in some other GPS denied environment um, to still determine its position relatively accurately. So what we do is um, essentially triangulate position of, of a host aircraft based on the angle of arrival of multiple ADSB signals. Um, and then given, given enough signals from enough aircraft that have accurate positioning, we can determine a fairly accurate position of our, our own aircraft. Um, it's relatively simple in concept and turned out to be quite complex in practice. So we, we never actually, or I never actually uh, took this to fruition. It was all done through simulation. Um, but I, I think I was able to prove that the, the concept is viable and there's still some technological hurdles involved in um, bringing that sort of a solution to market, but um, it's feasible. That's really what it boils down to. Um, my experience as a student is probably quite a bit different than, than everyone else's. Um, without going into too much gory detail, I. Uh, entered the Marine Corps right out of high school, and I spent eight and a half years as a United States Marine. And uh, by the time I, I left the Marine Corps, I was married with a family and had to support a family while working full time and trying to close the gap uh, in my education. So uh, the non-traditional student, I received an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, and then finally in April of 2019, my master's degree. And I've decided that at this point, um, I think my educational journey is, is about over. Um, not that I don't enjoy it. I actually, I do miss the learning, but um, I also have to be there for my family and, and the other obligations and focusing a little more on my career. I'm now a, a senior engineer at GE Aviation here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I've been with GE since uh, 2003. Um, and they've fully supported my academic endeavors and I've been able to grow in my professional career as I, I grew in my educational uh, endeavors. Is there anything else that you'd like to ask? Anyone else have any questions that, uh, that could help answer? I was just wondering since uh, Benny and Richard, since we talked about uh, you know, effective mentoring practices, if you could talk about your experiences uh, regarding uh, mentoring from your advisors and as a graduate student in general. Benny, you want to go first? Sure. Um, I, yeah, it's <laughs> my, I've, it's been very important to me to have sort of several mentors to not be completely reliant on one one advisor. I have an advisor that is excellent and has been really important in sort of not, not micromanaging my research, not sort of overseeing every single day-to-day day -day aspect of my research, but asking very important questions and giving very important advice in sort of key moments to sort of shape the empirical analysis and theoretical framework of of my work and that's been great. And then I've also just been, it's been really important to me to work with him on some of that stuff, have another mentor who's been helped me learn how to teach and become a teacher. Um, another mentor who's helped me think more about the public facing aspect of my work and how to write for a public audience. So it's just been very, that aspect of having a kind of team has been really critical to me. 
So my experience is maybe a little different, um, again, as, as more of a non-traditional student. Um, I don't know that I would categorize that I, I had much mentorship uh, through my associates and bachelor's degree program. Um, once I got into the master's program, I, I did get connected with uh, Dr. Bain from, from Grand Valley State, and he had a background similar to mine and similar to the field that I was working in. And, and we made a good connection there. And he did a really nice job of, of helping to keep me on track. And, you know, as Benny said, ask the, the intelligent questions that make you think rather than just, um, you know, trying to turn the crank and get you through the process. And that's kind of a double-edged sword because sometimes you could get done a lot faster if you would just turn the crank and call good enough, good enough and move on with your life. But it's those, um, those open-ended questions that, that really lead to the discovery. And that's uh, where I think a good mentor comes in. And uh, in my professional experience, you know, we throw the word mentor around kind of loosely. You know, everyone wants to sign up to, to mentor and help train the next generation. But the reality is, is it's very hard. It takes a commitment from both the mentor and the mentee. And it's often very easy to go into a, a mentoring relationship uh, with guns ablazing, if you will, and then have that wane out over time. Um, because it is hard. It, it requires you know, planning and, and staying in touch. And um, I, I think I could do better at it myself. And I've actually taken some notes from our, from our breakout session that, that I may be trying to apply in my professional life. So thank you for that. Thank you. We do have plenty of time. And if anyone in the audience have questions to Benny or Richard, this could be an opportune time. Uh, we have two outstanding students here who have benefited uh, from effective mentoring and uh, great uh, advice and outstanding quality of uh, product. And so um, I invite um, any of you to ask questions either through the chat box or use your audio feature, particularly to Benny and Richard. Richard, uh, if you don't mind me asking a quick uh, follow-up, um, one of the things I noted from uh, letters of support for your, uh, your thesis submission was the balance of um, independence as well as uh, reliance on maybe that, that professional advice from your, your advisor throughout your graduate work. I wonder if you can speak a little bit to how your life experience prior to that um, may have lent to or uh, enhance the, the independence, your your courageousness, maybe, um, and or the creativity in the project. Well, there's a there's a fine line between independence and stubbornness. I think um, part of it too had to do with um, early in my professional career. I had the privilege of working with um, an engineer who was on the cusp of retirement while I was just kind of entering the field. And he was very meticulous, very professional, and sort of set the standard and expectation for me. Um, and so when I entered you know, this sort of academic research, I had in my mind what it meant to be a good engineer and to develop you know, a piece of quality work. And I strove for that. Um, and there is a bit of stubbornness there because Dr. Bain kind of got to the point where he was encouraging me to finish, and I didn't think I was quite right yet. Um, so I, I extended a semester or two longer, maybe three, but nobody's counting, um, to come up with a result that I would be proud of. Uh, and I, I try to apply that to a lot of things that I do. Um, especially in my professional work. You know, I, I work in the aviation industry. We develop safety critical software. Um, not that, that that all falls on my shoulders personally, but I'm a step in that safety critical chain. And I, I take that seriously. You know, there are a lot of checks and balances to try to make sure that, that we don't have safety escapes, but um, it takes everyone to, to have that, that right serious 
um, professional attitude and and that's what I tried to apply to the paper is, is I wanted it to be reflective of a professional engineer more than a student. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. So I'm just reading from, uh, from the chat message from Dr. Roper. Benny and R Richard, do you have any suggestions on how graduate students can overcome writing stupor and persisting to writing an excellent product as you both have done? Benny, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Writing stupor is a great phrase that I'm going to have to think about. Um, my advisor and I have um, set up a kind of dynamic where he asks me to just send him a lot of writing um, and not always stuff that he's gonna gonna really read right it's so there are, there are key moments where he has read sort of word for word every part of an of a paper and given me line by line edits and that's been a huge help in making a final product but that's also incredibly time consuming for him um, and for me but the other piece of it is just him saying, you know, like, it, by two weeks, I want you to send me another 10 pages, but um, I'm not going to like, don't, I'm not going to read those 10 pages. I just want them in my inbox so that you keep having that kind of that benchmark to, to, to keep yourself moving. And that's been really important to kind of getting out of those roadblocks for me. The roadblocks for me tend to come when I try to sit down and be too perfect. Um, quite often I sit down and think that I can write the final draft on draft one and then I'll get bogged down in the details. Um, so I find just going back to the fundamentals of just writing down the main idea and then filling in, filling in the, the flowery verbiage later uh, helps me overcome, you know, sort of that, that writing block. But it's a little bit different in, in engineering discipline too, because it's less about our thoughts and feelings and more about what we what we observed and and how we got there. Um, it's almost more of a framework that can be followed to present engineering STEM material. Um, but you can still certainly get bogged down. And and again, I just um, I find that even writing it poorly, but but getting the main ideas, even in a bulletized list or in a sentence or two and then filling it in later has helped me. Dr. DeHart, do you have a question for Benny? Go ahead, yeah, please. Benny, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll verbalize it. I know I wrote it in the chat, but um, I wonder, you know, so you mentioned you moved from your, your master's thesis, which is what this award is for, onto your, to your PhD. Can you just talk a little bit about uh, what are your what are your career goals? Why did you decide to move on to a PhD? And how is that preparing you for your next step? Um, I really have fallen in love with teaching as uh, as having been able to teach throughout my um, my graduate work. I really have, I, I love teaching and would love to continue teaching. And so my career goal at this point is um, hopefully some kind of academic job at a more teaching focused university or college. Um, and so I've been doing this, my graduate work has helped me in sort of building a research agenda, hopefully building publications that can help me get a, an academic job, but also building up a, a record of teaching um, and that can help me get the type of job I want. At the same time, I've also, again, the importance of kind of multiple mentors been working with some other folks that do more community-based research um, and have had a few, a few opportunities to do sort of community-based public-facing research that um, is sort of an alternative career possibility for me that I've been trying to build up as, um, as you all know, the vagaries of trying to find an academic job. Dr. Dehart, uh, any final comments? You have, uh, your committee has worked incredibly hard 
and we are deeply grateful for uh, the uh, committee's hard work in sifting through these uh, wonderful theses. And I remain grateful to you, Dr. DeHart and Dr. Denise Collins. It's, um, it's, it's an onerous task. And also all the reviewers uh, who reviewed the thesis and provided quality feedback. Yeah, I think also, yeah. Like you said, um, Ranjit, it, the, the credit also goes to everyone who sorted through all of these. Uh, Benny and Richard, so you know, there are you know, experts from all around the Midwest. We all kind of tapped our networks of folks in the field so that we were having people that were familiar with work uh, to be able to rate things like the impact of the work, the quality of the writing relative to uh, peers in those same areas. So um, credit, credit goes to you. We're here to celebrate you today. Um, uh, but with uh, a, a lot of appreciation to those that were able to review um, and, and support this. So uh, congratulations, Richard and Benny, again, great work. Oh, uh, thank you, Dr. DeHart, for your help with the uh, MAGS ProQuest Distinguished uh, Thesis Award. Uh, and I'm also grateful to Dr. Dennis Collins, who could not uh, join with us. Uh, she has served as uh, the chair of this uh, important committee for several years, and we are grateful uh, to her for her service and also to Dr. DeHart for joining as a co-chair in identifying uh, some of the exceptional work uh, from uh, our uh, talented students. Mags is also very uh, thankful to ProQuest uh, for their support, Ms. Julia Smith. Uh, wants to extend uh, her uh, greetings and well wishes and congratulations to you, Benny, and to Richard. Uh, she is unable to join with us, but uh, we have strong support from ProQuest and without their sponsorship, we would not be able to uh, award uh, the monetary prize money. And so we remain grateful uh, to ProQuest. Uh, dear Mags and WKU colleagues, thank you for joining with us and taking time uh, to learn about affecting mentoring practices. I remain grateful uh, to uh, Dr. Janice Bloom and Dr. Randall Roper uh, for uh, sharing uh, their experiences. In, coincidentally, they had also talked about the same topic at the annual virtual meeting in spring. And we felt that this is an important topic for all of us to learn, be educated and serve our students uh, better. So I hope you enjoyed uh, both these events, uh, the first related to effective mentoring practices and the celebration of two exceptionally talented graduate students, Benny and Richard. So uh, thank you again uh, on behalf of the MAG's executive committee. Uh, we want to thank you for your support and uh, we hope to see you at a CGS annual meeting or the uh, next uh, annual conference that, that Dr. Kerry Wilkes uh, will be uh, sharing or chairing, I should say. So have a wonderful rest of your day and so long from uh, Bowling Green, uh, Kentucky, you're a Max Chair Ranjit. <laughs>